You are listening to Be the Love, transcending through the shadows into a higher state of consciousness. We are souls on the journey, opening up the conversation to heal, awaken, and connect ourselves and the planet to a higher vibration of love frequency. It starts with you. Everything you need is within you. This is your time. I am Stacy Musial. And I am Sam Fernandez, and we are your co-hosts at Be The Love Podcast. Thank you for tuning in and ascending with us. Hop on board the Ascension Bus. This is Jules DeVito from Highly Sensitive Humans. This is Katie Jo Holton. We are Michael and Jamie Thornhill at Casa Galactica. This is Tara Jolly. I'm Anna Anderson, and you are listening to Be The Love Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Be the Love, Transcending Through the Shadows. I am Stacey Musial, your host and soul on the journey. And thank you so much for tuning in this week. And if you've enjoyed listening to our show, we would absolutely love a five-star written review on iTunes. Reviews really help the show become more visible and spread the word to others. And if it feels safe for you, I'd like to begin by inviting you to get centered with us. I'd like to begin by inviting you to take a beautiful cleansing breath in through your nose and out through your mouth, releasing anything that is keeping you from being present. And take another deep breath in through your nose, breathing in calm, peaceful, loving energy, and breathing out anything you are ready to release in this now moment. And take one more breath in through your nose, breathing in light, and love for yourself and breathing out that light and love and send it back to all of humanity, remembering that you always, always have your breath to come back to. Today, we have Charles Higgins. Charles, also known as Chip, currently incarcerated in one of the most roughest prison systems in America. He is an individual who has struggled with many dark alleys, and despite his current circumstances, he has found enlightenment in the path of kingism which he has written books on, Wordplay, The Poetry of a King, which is a poetic justice for those with an heir to the art of hip-hop, and Reflections, a memoir of Unity Calls, which is his first memoir. In Reflections, Charles describes the lessons that were taught over that period of time to encompass love, something in his religion, which is to be displayed in actions as well as words. So thank you so much for being here today, Charles. Thank you for inviting me. It's actually uh, an incredible honor and uh, a pleasure. Absolutely. I am very excited just to have this conversation with you. And so tell us about your journey leading up to now. Well, I mean, my journey has been experienced, if nothing else, good, bad, and full of a lot of hard decisions where I was blessed enough to learn from. I grew up in Massachusetts. And I left the day I turned 18 to Las Vegas, Nevada. I moved back and forth between two, for the few next few years, two years between periods of incarceration. Finally, in 2005, I came to Mississippi, trying to find a way to get myself together and still struggle with life's lessons I've learned about some of the fundamental basics like love. Thank you for sharing that. And so, how would you say that? your upbringing influenced your decisions and your path? Well, it took me a long time to realize and come to terms with everything happens for a reason, like divine intervention. My upbringing was just an entire learning experience to lead me to the path that I'm on now, to be able to experience some of the lowest lows so that when I reach the highest highs, I can love and respect it that much more. Growing up, I watched uh, uh, the word love be misused often. And most who claimed it actually lacked it in the beautiful perspective that it is, that it is and should be. But if I didn't experience that, maybe I wouldn't have understood it as well as I do today. All the good, the bad, 
it was an experience to learn from and truly understand what love is today. And so how, how would you say your path has led you to love? It was truly amazing how the lights turned on. Sometimes it, to reveal certain things in an individual's life. As a youthful offender in Massachusetts, I read the entire Bible from front to back. It never took hold of me to actually use its words as a guideline to live by. That, with my own personal history of a lack of true love or seeing it around me, I took it lightly. In 2008, I went back to prison and came across the name Yahweh. Something in the name drew me to it. And once I began to utilize it regularly, replace it in the sacred scriptures of the Bible, I started to grasp it more of the concept of love. What he meant when he said, love me and love thy neighbor as you love thyself. Yet where I found the name that made me search for more meaning within the sacred scriptures was in the literature of the AOKQN. That's the almighty Latin Kings and Queens nation. To understand it in a religious aspect was truly paramount in laying each brick of my proverbial path that I've had to walk on. Thank you for sharing that. And so I'd love to just hear more about your thoughts as far as what does it truly mean to love ourselves as, it, as we, or love our neighbors as we do ourselves? Can you talk a little bit more about that? First and foremost, you should love yourself. And some people don't. Some people miss that, and, you know, they think less of themselves. And, and that's a, a more of an issue with the way I, I'm guessing that they were treated. You know what I mean? They think less of themselves. They degrade themselves. They put themselves on a lower pedestal than they actually should be. And you should love yourself. And you should love everyone like you love yourself. And that's showing your next neighbor, no matter what they do, what they, how they slight you or whatever, that you still don't want to see nothing wrong or bad happen to them. You know, their own problems are their own problems. They cause of their own problems. But still, you know, to not hate them, not, not drive on, on that anger and resentment, that nastiness to keep going down that same path because that's taking you away from the love that you should actually be given to other people and to yourself. How can you actually love everybody else if you can't love yourself? So you're loving yourself should be first and foremost and treating everybody the same way that you want to be treated should be like a mirrored reflection. Thank you for sharing that. And one thing I forgot to mention before we got started or as we were getting started that Charles or Chip um, is also my cousin. And so we come from, we have the same family on my mother's side. And so I know one thing that we had shared a little bit about is some of the generational trauma and just some of that upbringing that has been passed around. And so I'm just wondering, I'm curious, like how going through some of the trauma that you've experienced, um, how would you say that you've overcome that and, and if you don't mind sharing a little bit, overcome that and come to a place of love and acceptance around that trauma that is so ingrained in, I think, all of our psyches. I don't think that getting over the trauma is ever going to happen to the point like it's here today and gone tomorrow. I think that it can be dealt with and that you can get past it and move on and learn from it. You know, that it happened. It's an experience that you can learn from. Getting over it is a whole nother thing. I mean, it's just not, it's not something that just magically happens, you know, and you deal with it, but you don't carry it around like a crutch. A wise brother once told me that when you come full circle, you know, 360 degrees whole, a circle, if you put it on a table, it will not stay still. It's going to roll because there's nothing to hold it. You need crutches to hold it. But people take those crutches often and they try to use them as excuses mm -hmm. for what they can do. i use myself as an example. If I used it as an excuse of my upbringing or oh, how bad, you know, this happened or that happened, and this is why I do what I do, I would be nothing but continuing 
on a path of degradation that really shouldn't exist for whatever reason and allowing it to happen. Like I would be subjecting myself that this is okay. This is acceptable because of this. And it's not, it's never acceptable. You should rise above the occasion and use your, your experiences to move forward in a positive light that you can, you can change what isn't already changed amongst yourself. There's other things that are going on, whether you have kids or grandkids, that you can teach them what you went through so that it doesn't happen again in their lifetime. You know, it be that, be that role model, be that teacher, be that influencer of change, that agent of change. Hmm. That's beautiful. And it sounds like really it's moving outside of victimhood and really taking an empowered stance to recognize that we are empowered individuals. We're really sovereign to make the changes that we want and our past does not have to equal our future. Sounds really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm wondering, you know, yeah. I'm like being in, you know, incarcerated right now, I'm sure you probably see a lot of people who have a lot of trauma and are victims of their circumstances or feeling victims of their circumstances. And I'm wondering, how do you, like, in your opinion, how do you think we can rise above this broken justice system, help people heal their traumas and raise consciousness to awaken people to their true potential? The work will have to be on them. You have a lot of people here. Some are here for small minor mistakes and they lock them up with people that are here for killing. There is no, there is no system that, that separates the two. And they learn different things from them and people get taken advantage of all the time from the system and people inside because this is, the, this is what they see from the same people that are locking them up. And a lot of them are stuck on drugs substance abuse and that's how they're trying to deal with their traumas you know it's not right it's one of the repetitive cycles that keep coming back and they keep the the bed the beds filled to make sure that recidivism is at its highest rate they'll sit there and talk about how many they've let out of prison and whatever but they're not telling you how many are in the court system ready to come in to take their place because these beds are not becoming empty no matter what people say or how they put it, whatever paint picture they paint, these beds are not becoming empty. That would be less money for the system, less money for them, less money for their coffers, less money for the, the people that own these privately owned prisons. And dealing with these people's trauma, you have people with mental health issues, that real mental health issues, not just ones that say their mental health, and they leave them in here and man, they're not getting the help they need. They say something, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, we, we, we offered it and you know, they didn't want it or they try to put them on uh, medication and the medication doesn't, you know, is not watched properly and doesn't align with what he's supposed to be doing or what he's supposed to be taking. Or if he is on medication and they hand it to him, but they don't watch him take it and make sure he don't, he, throws it out, doesn't want it, you know what I mean? These people are not cared for like they should be because the people that are working here, the people that are paid here, that they not paid to care, they're paid to do a job and they really just, they fluff it off like, yeah, nobody's paying attention, I just do what I want. And, you know, it's like working at McDonald's and you know, yeah, well I swept the floor, but uh, get mopping it, you know, it doesn't matter, right? nobody gonna notice it. And that's the same attitude that everybody takes. Not everybody that works here, but a majority. I mean, it, it catches. So it is things that are being taken advantage of in the system all over from the top to the bottom. And it's going to take, obviously, them working with people inside and people inside having something to work for. Like, man, there's people with life sentences that are not here for murder. You know what I mean? The three strikes you're out, whatever uh, the laws that came about in the 90s with Bill Clinton. And they got their third conviction of a violent crime or a mandatory minimum on a drug sentence or something. And they got a life sentence. And they got no opportunity to get out. 
why in their right mind would that person even want to consider trying to change or anything like that you're not giving them any opportunity to try to change you're not you, this, they got nothing to look forward to they in their mind their life is over with so they say forget the system forget life and just go ahead first and it's not a good concept to have but this is the concept that was created by those laws and by those people and how they kept infiltrating the perspective of those laws definitely a, a system but makes it really difficult to feel that motivation um it reminds me of the the book a man's search for meaning where victor frankel he was in the holocaust for many years and he was and he was surrounded by people losing purpose and meaning and not being able to see a way out but he held on to that meaning you know what was it going to be like for him to to get out and you know searching for meaning among the darkest of the darkest times and he had to really sit with that and he created logos therapy and he eventually got out of the concentration camp but that's you know reminded me of of that because there are those the bleakness and trying to find you know meaning and purpose in a time where maybe you know you've made some mistakes or have done things that you know you wish you could take back and and then recognizing that you're in a system that doesn't allow that place to really reform uh, because you're stuck in a system that doesn't give you any way out i'm wondering um have you seen people other prisoners or people ascending to higher dimensions while incarcerated? And if so, how have you seen them doing that? I have. Um, while incarcerated, there are still many things that people can do that they don't imagine that they can. But no matter what it is, it takes that person's individual efforts. Many can say that they will do things and you know, it's up to them to do them. You don't need to be incarcerated to know that because even people out there say they're going to do things and they don't do them. You know, it's magnified behind the walls because everything that you do is like 10 times more than if you were out there. And I use this a lot with, with people when I'm trying to show them and hear how disgusting and nasty some people are and you never know because they'll have a bag of chips open and they'll want to go around and put their hands, you know, and somebody will ask for some or whatever. And it's like, dude, I just seen that guy in the bathroom go number two and not wash his hands. And now his hands are in your bag of chips. And it, it, it's, it's like, it's not that people here are much more nastier. This happens in the world. We just don't see it because we don't go to the bathroom with people. You know, here you don't have a choice because you're around people 24 7. Mm -hmm. And it's up to each individual to change their actions, to do themselves, to aspire to go higher. And I can only use myself as an example to some degree. A lot of people told me what I couldn't do behind bars, how I couldn't write books and publish them. Then I began researching how and learning different aspects of it by reading and writing in a process of elimination of what worked and what didn't work. Now I have two books published and I'm working on so many more. But again, that was individual work. Instead of talking about it, putting it into action and actually doing it. There's plenty of different types of people that I've met, gifted people, incarcerated. I've met throughout the years that I've done time. Artists, poets, writers, cooks, people with business acumen, and some who learned legal avenues to become paralegals. Some have even reopened their individual cases and got themselves released to where they were hindered previously by court-appointed lawyers. Because court-appointed lawyers, I mean, while some do their job and some have been beneficial, for the most part, it's just another job, like another floor that they could forget to mop. You know what I mean? They don't have a real want to do it. You know what I mean? It's not high on their priority list. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so it sounds like, yeah, there's um, definitely, you know, people and it, 
comes from that internal drive, right? That when someone wants to do something, it really does take it as with anything, we have to look within before we can uh, really move forward because it, it, we have to recognize that we are the ones that we've been waiting for, that we get to choose and move forward in our life. And, and it does take that recognition that just because you're in some place that has been, you know, in this system, in this box, it doesn't have to keep you down. It does not have to keep you stuck in your circumstances. And so I'm curious too, just in your, in your opinion and, and things that you've seen, you know, because this can be an oppressive place, right? And, and so how do we overcome the darkness of oppression within and rise above? Well, I can only speak for myself here, how I'm able to overcome it. And hopefully somebody else can learn from it. There is no designed format or system to accomplish it. Different things work for different people, sure. But I do believe if we can all have an open mind to the next individual, it'll benefit everyone as a whole. In a religious aspect, love thy neighbor as you love yourself, as we talked about earlier. But I also guess the first part of that is getting people to love themselves more. For me, I didn't take care of my body, what I commonly refer to as my temple. Before I found Yahweh through the religion of Kingism by the ALKQM, so I was steadily running around being ignorant and abusing my temple with substances. And I look at it like some would the program or AA or NA. Work the program and it'll work for you. Get out of it what you put into it. Find a higher power through it. It made me want to understand religion better. It made me want to stay sober. How can I not be grateful nor blessed for it? The woman I refer to in the introduction of my poetry book, Wordplay, Poetry of a King, as Ma, told me recently how amazed she is that I'm able to rise above things that will steadily pull a common person into darkness that persists with any and all oppression. Man, I love that woman. Words like that from the people that you love for whatever reasons can be monumental in the actions to know that you were following a good path. She was the first true person who tried to show me the sacred scriptures when I still lacked understanding until I found the education that opened up the darkness of my own mind to shed some true light on those same sacred scriptures and give them meaning that I have today. Like a fog that persists until the sun finally broke through it. I was no longer asleep in the graveyard of ignorance. For each person, I would have to suggest to work and have faith. And a higher power, sure, but in yourself as well, as you can truly do anything you put your mind to and love the process and the people around you. As things become clearer to you, help you somehow, help someone who doesn't see as well as you once did. Let me go back to the Bible when I sit there and say, you know, when we talked about love your, that love your neighbor as you love yourself. Even in that good book, they talked about giving sight to the blind often enough. Our words to each other can describe everything we see and act on. We as a people should be able to build our communities with love. I found that love for people in my community through the ALKQM. Mm. Thank you. And so I'm wondering, just since you found sobriety, how has that shifted your own emotional self, your experiences, and helped you to move forward in life? But you know, when I when I used to use, I haven't I haven't used in over 20 years now. When I used to use, it was because I was young, ignorant, and I just really didn't give much care for the world, you know. But as I grew up and I started experiencing things more and seeing things differently and becoming accustomed to the religion that I'm accustomed to now, my eyes started opening and like, damn, you know, I like that. I, I like to do that. I'd like to achieve that. And being sober actually was a more benefit to me, no matter whether I got myself back into prison, that that's irregardless of the point, the point is that 
that I had things. I had momentum in my life. I mean, I had, I got married at one time. I had kids. I got grandkids all because of the choices that I made to stay sober and actually do something positive with my life. No matter where I ended up and stay focused on trying to better myself at every time, every turn, every obstacle, because negativity is going to follow you. It doesn't matter where you go or what you do. Misery loves company and the world is full of more miserable people than people that are not miserable. So for us to overcome that, we have to single-handedly rise above negativity. And if you could shed your light with somebody else, you might be able to brighten their day to say, you know what, man, that, that was tough, but you know, I, I can get through that. I can overcome that myself. I think I found some purpose now, some, something to give me a better breath in the morning when I wake up and say, that's easy. That, 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 that takes the cake away. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. We need to rise above that. Absolutely. And, and just be the love. Um, cause what's, what's within us is without us. And we, we are a mirror every, the world is a mirror to what's happening within. And we will begin to attract the things in our life that we need when we truly show up in a loving place. I'm wondering if you can just talk about what oneness means to you. Oneness, one whole, you know, your community from top to bottom, everybody, even the ones that are indiscriminate and whatever. I mean, no matter what, they're going to depend on everybody in that community that does good. Like a seed that is in the dark, it's going to grow but it still depends on the light, whether it can see it or not. Some people will never learn better, never know better, but we can't allow them to affect to what we got going on for our children and our children's children. And we still have to do the right thing, irregardless of what other people do. It doesn't matter how bad the system in here treats us. And I'll use that as an example. We still have to do the right thing, irregardless that they're not doing the right thing. Hopefully one day we can meet somewhere in the middle and, you know, come up to a better solution. But at the meantime, if we go ahead and crash out and do the wrong thing, we're not going to do anything but put ourselves in a worse place, a worse predicament than we're already in. That's not going to help anybody. So us to help our own selves as people, we need to, we need to do what we can to better our predicaments, our community, and enjoy everybody else that wants that. You know what I mean? Like, grow it as a community, as a team. More people are going to step up for righteous stuff and righteous causes as they have been all over the world. And I use uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement as an example. You know, and it's not about one color. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with about people's lives. All people's lives are, are at stake. All people's lives are matter. All people's lives are what the focus is. It doesn't matter what what the, the, the insignia is because you have more people of every color standing up for that movement of righteousness than you, than you did previously over the years as this stuff has been going on because this wasn't new stuff. This was stuff that has been going on for the last, what, 40, 50 years, longer. I'm just using a, a guideline as long as we've been alive. And we just haven't seen it because the news only portrays a certain point of view. And these news companies were owned by the rich upper class that subjugates lower class people to what they want to subjugate them to. And uh, man, there's a lot of positive movement in the, in the world right now, just on stuff like that. And it takes community to do that. It took community to stand up. It took community to speak out. And actually my book, Reflections, speaks about it a little bit. Speaks about at a time in 2015, when I began, we began teaching on it. It speaks about the unrighteous murders of different people in this country, black and brown people. 
it happens to all kinds of people. But at that, at the rate that that class was being subjugated was, was despicable. And it's great to see everybody come together on one accord and move forward and say, hey, we've had enough. That's a powerful voice when you have one whole speaking up. And this is uh, my poetry book, Wordplay. Thank you for sharing that and just recognizing that there's really no separation. We're all we're all in this together. We all have to rise up together and we all have to just love and recognize that we're all on this journey and we can all move forward on this journey together. We just have to work together with community. So I'm wondering, I just kind of curious too, like how, how do you keep your vibration up despite the environment you're in? What does that look like for you? Well, actually that's, that's a pretty good question. I actually had to look up vibrations because I'm not, I'm not up to date on terminology. And I sat there and I read it before we got on and well, self-awareness, definitely. It's something that does lack in the world not just in here. People are not aware of themselves, never mind their surroundings. They don't pay attention because I guess this is kind of to the saying that ignorance is bliss. They'd rather be ignorant because they, they don't want to know the truth. But being self-aware of your surroundings and, and your health and everything that's going on with you, that I would definitely consider, constitute with vibrations, you know? As we were speaking about substance abuse earlier, staying clean, you know, there's a reason, there's a purpose of staying clean. And then vibrations, man, my vibrations have been so much better today than they were 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, because I chose to stay clean. I chose to walk uh, the path that I walk. And, you know, I am aware of my surroundings to what's going on. And being aware, well, sometimes it's depressing because you, you see so much of the bad going on. At least you're aware of it that you can help try to implement change and put your piece in wherever your piece is needed to be an effect in that community or that environment that you're in. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, I think that's, you know, self-awareness. It's it's really about self-awareness because if we don't, if we're not aware of the self, we can't shift our energy. We can't make those changes that we want to. So we can move forward in the life that we want to create. So Chip, I'm wondering if you would be willing to provide a poetry reading for us today from your book, Wordplay. Certainly. This is the second poem that I wrote without any cuss words or swearing. I mean, it was just a habit that I had growing up and we were not opposed to using the F word or anything else in anything that we wrote or talked about in normal conversation, you know? So I've grown up so much since then. And a founding in my religion after this, it's called Lord Forgive Me. Lord, forgive me, forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry, Lord, but I know I'm going to sin again. Lord, forgive me, forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry, Lord, but I know I'm going to sin again. Lord, I can't thank you enough for everything that I got and everything that I don't, everything I'll ever be and everything that I won't. Lord, forgive me because I know I'm not alone. But every time I try, I still feel like I'm on my own, plagued with distorted visions, based on moral decisions that got me praying for forgiveness. Just in case you listen, a little spiritual assistance, Lord, when you catch me slipping. But please don't help me if I put myself in this position. My problems are repetitious, so addictively reckless. I can't even begin to explain how things got so hectic. Really, I'm just beginning to accept it. My own self-reflections, everything I do and how my world is affected. My loved ones are objective. I'm instantly rejected. I could turn around now, but my life's already been projected. Got it by the light. The Lord is my shepherd. There's a deeper meaning to the words on this record. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry, Lord, but I know I'm going to sin again. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry, Lord, but I know I'm going to sin again. Lord, 
How many times have I been led astray and tried to make amends in my own way? Try to keep my emotions to bank, control my rage before they're exposed and explode in my face. I'm keeping my head held high and I'm holding it straight. But I feel at home in this cage and I'm afraid it's my fate. We eat what we sow, so I eat what I grow and clear the plate. Nobody knows how hard I have tried to clean the slate. And every time that I cry, Lord, it's me that I hate. I speak for myself and so someone else can relate. Because I know I'm not the only one who feels out of place. I try so hard, Lord, to live life at a reasonable pace. But the speed seems to accelerate every time that I break. And Lord, I find myself right back behind these gates. Alone in my cell with plenty of time for old mistakes. I'll hope and I'll pray, but I'm not going to beg my case. Put my life on hold and let it go to waste. Lord, I'm going to own these flows because my soul escapes. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry, Lord, but I know I'm going to sin again. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry, Lord, but I know I'm going to sin again. Hmm. Oh, that's powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. I'm just wanting to maybe hear a little bit about the inspiration for that. Well, I had done a poem around the same exact time, and it was for my son. I've got two sons and a daughter. My daughter and my, son, my first son are older than my natural born son because they were adopted. One's a stepdaughter, and the other son was adopted. I had just found out that my son Nathan was born that year. And I went back, waiting for extradition, come back to Mississippi. And I had wrote a poem that's in my book called Never Alone. It was the first full ballad I had ever wrote without any swearing. Cussing was just so ingrained as being a language of my environment. I wrote how I had visioned I would perceive my goals at that time, if given a chance with my son. And I sat there and I pondered for a while. And I said, if I can do that for my son, which you know is right, I could do that for a power that I believe is greater than me. And so then I wrote, Lord, forgive me. I wrote in 2006, Following my previous selection, I'm talking about Never Alone, I was so inspired by writing without swearing for my son, so why not do it when I speak of the Almighty? I thought of a recent song by DMX, May He Rest in Peace, that moved me, give me a sign. And how taken away I've always been by his previous lyrical sermons, every album had at least one, and to the King of Kings. So I tried to follow that positive example in those steps of righteousness. DMX passed away this year. At every album, he had a sermon. And while some of his music was dark, it came from an environment that was dark. It represented that environment. But he always spoke about the Almighty in the highest, in the highest regard. There was nothing that took away from that. And man, that was powerful. That's actually probably how a lot of people wanted to get into sermon stuff because of that man. Well, thank you. I can definitely see the, just the inspiration behind that. So tell our listeners how they can find you and what you're currently working on. Okay. Um, I do have an Amazon page and I believe that you have that, uh, you're going to list that in the bio. Uh, yes, I'll put that in the show it, notes. It's author's page, uh, Charles Higgins. I'm definitely on Facebook and Twitter at chip underscore Higgins on Twitter, uh, Charles William Higgins on Facebook and I don't know because I'm not understanding on technology. My, my daughter keeps up with all the stuff. And my wife had made the page for my author's page. But uh, uh, you would see, obviously, copies of the books on there. What I'm working on now, I've got a few more memoirs to write. I've got another poetry book called Arise. And I'm working on a series called An Insider's Guide to Doing Time. Because prison is one of the biggest businesses in America. People are coming to prison and 
they don't know better and they get taken advantage by some of the people in here, whether it be the staff or whether it be an inmate that's just trying to fatten their pockets. And my best friend, Caesar, he had told me, he said, Chip, if I went to prison, God forbid never happened, but he says, if I went to prison, I'd want to call you. I'd want to ask you what to do. Started, you know, scratching my head and be like, man, on the, on the slick, you really just called me, you know, and, and he put it out there. It's like, I'm a professional. I'm like, hold on, man. I, I kind of took offense to it. But when he kept going on with his spiel, he made a point. When you have your car and you're having problems with it, you bring it to a professional mechanic. When you have something wrong with your, with your temple, with your body, you go see a doctor, somebody who's a specialist in it. And unfortunately, with my choice of lifestyle as before I found, you know, Yahweh and before I got myself clean, I've been in and out of institutions my whole life. So you want to ask me as a professional how to do your time. So we came up with the idea, an insider's guide to doing time. And that's what I began writing when my wife passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, we're actually almost through with it. And we're going to turn it into a series because there's so many things that an insider has that other people want to know or will enjoy even outside how to cook, you know, without using the conventional ways of an oven and stove, you know, writing books, how, how I wrote my books, how I got published, how I uh, marketed it, everything, you know, so we're going to start a series called an insider's guide to doing time and, you know, build off that and, uh, hopefully just make some positive movements and people can take some reflection from the, from the experiences and utilize them to their best advantage so that they can understand how things are done or how things were, or maybe even if there's still some things that persist like that, they can go ahead and make changes so we can all, you know, make our communities better. Mm. That sounds like it could be really helpful for a lot of people and maybe help them find purpose too within that realm. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Chip. And thank you for having this beautiful conversation. And thank you for listening to our show. Stay tuned for more episodes being released on Mondays at 5.55 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And if you've enjoyed listening to our show, we would absolutely love a five-star written review on iTunes. And of course, please share the love by sharing it with your friends. And if you want to support the work that we're doing, please consider making a donation to our show by visiting our Patreon website at patreon.com forward slash be the love podcast. And until next time, love yourself, love each other, and love the world. We love you. We at Be The Love Podcast are honored to be supporting the Komodi Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization in Uganda that is working to build a school that will promote and support healthcare, education, skills development, feeding the hungry, human rights, and environmental defenders. Their goal is to work with young mothers and single mothers, street children, and vulnerable families who lack nurture as they guide them to become productive individuals, which will lead to a productive generation. Please see our show notes on how to become a donor, mentor, volunteer, or sponsor. Thank you, Heather Lynn, for providing us with your beautiful song to accompany our show, Be The Love. If you would like to learn more about Heather Lynn and her music, please visit her website at heatherlynnmusic.com. And thank you, Chrissy Grace at Leading Edge Productions for the beautiful design and graphics. And thank you for tuning in. And until next time, we are souls on the journey. And thank you for hopping on the Ascension bus with us. And remember, there is always a seat for you.